So, good morning to everyone. Yes, my name is Aito Rosa. I work in <coughs> ArcelorMittal Steel Company. And before starting, I would like to comment that it was foreseen that uh, Mr. Rune Pepen, in charge of ArcelorMittal Steel Fiber Technical Department, joined us today just to make this presentation. But due to some health problem, uh, he was not able just to come here today. So I will try to do it as, as, best, as, as best as I can. So let's go to start. Mm, steel fiber reinforced concrete in housing application. I will try to show you in this short presentation how steel fiber reinforced concrete has been progressing over the last years in a structural application. Let's go to move. Uh, as introduction, uh, steel fiber reinforced concrete has been used for long years almost exclusively in flooring, uh, slab on grade, especially in shot kit in tunneling application. Uh, today, the interest in a steel fire reinforced concrete solution is growing quickly, uh, mainly in European countries, and mainly for this reason. A high salary of manpower, missing experienced job site people, shorter construction time, and variation between prices of traditional reinforcement and steel fibers. Mm -hmm. So uh, today, we can say that new promising structural applications are the precast element, the slab on piles, walls and foundation, plate roughs uh, for housing, and elevated free spanning floors, as we call them, tap slab, in housing, again, and multi-storage buildings. Mm -hmm. So uh, problems that we, that we face today. Uh, it is true that uh, in increasing dosage rate and improved uh, fiber performance, the post-cracking behavior is getting better up to reaching the full ductility, mm, which allows to control crack with opening as well as to guarantee the sufficient additional load bearing capacity after the first crack. With typical dosage rates uh, up to 40 kg per cubic meter uh, and normal performance fiber, this is not possible. So uh, today, the main problem that we can face is the high dosage rate, high fiber dosage rate, however often to work to workability problems. It means that the formation of, of bowling. Mm -hmm. So uh, the challenge that we, that we have today uh, is just to try to develop a steel fiber reinforced concrete uh, solution, which just in the first step, just guarantee the height ductility depending on the application, of course, sometimes it's not needed. Mm -hmm. Achieve a good saturation of the concrete matrix, allow an easier and more or less uniform integration of the fibers. This solution should be, and it's always pumpable eh, for longer distance without major problems. And the steel fiber reinforced concrete are almost self-leavening and self-compacting in order to avoid the segregation during the, the vibration. So uh, some test result on plate and beams show that with a good fiber and high dosage rate, it is possible to reach the full ductility. After the first cracking, uh, the load can still be increased by 30 to 50% before reaching the ultimate load. By using adequate concrete mix, uh, workability still remains good without fiber bowling. And the crack pattern of the, on the bottom of the plate test show that the ability of a steel fiber to of control the crack width. Mm -hmm. Let's go to move now to the full scale testing. The same or even better ductile behavior has been shown on the full scale test with a given geometry. This is a real test done in 2004 in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. It was a slab supported by four by four meter by four by four columns. Uh, the column width is six by six meter. The slab thickness 20 centimeter and the fiber uh, dosage rate 100 kg per cubic meter. And we test it in the ser under serviceability loads eh? and we reach just till the ultimate bearing load that I will show you right now just in the, in, in the graphics. Mm -hmm. uh, we have here some picture of this full scale testing eh? during the ultimate bearing load testing at the central span. In the bottom left side, uh, we have seen just a picture showing the consistency of the almost self-compacting and self-leveling concrete, as well as the stability of the very fluid concrete mix. Uh, in the bottom right side picture, you can see the distribution uh, in the concrete leading to a high saturation of the concrete matrix and thereby the uniform and ductile behavior. some load defection behavior of the three-panel test under the point load for ultimate bearing consideration. 
Again, the ultimate load was about 50 to 100 percent higher than the first crack load, while the central span testing was stopped at the deformation on, of 65 millimeter in order to not damage too much as the adjacent panel tested later on. The edge panel was deformed over 120 millimeters, and the corner panel even to 215 millimeter of deformation for a span of six meters. At this extreme deformation level, the residual level was still higher than the initial elastic load. Uh, we can see just in the diagram, just in the arrow, red arrow, is the first crack, and you can see just the, the bearing capacity after the, the ultimate load. Mm. Let's go to move now just to real cases. In the, first, in the first step, I will talk about the foundation plate and basement wall in, in Germany. This both wall and foundation uh, were approved by the German Institute for Certification in Construction. The rough foundation replaced traditional street foundation. Uh, in any case, I must say that even this street foundation can be done uh, with steel fibers. The thickness go from 20 to 30 centimeter, dosage rate to 20 to 30 kg per cubic meter of concrete, depending on the, on the, on the performance of the fiber. And I can say that in the last uh, 10 years, several thousand of projects has been done using this solution. Mm -hmm. Some pictures just to show more about this concrete in as well as uh, as an extract for the, this German certification. In the second place, we have the general rough uh, foundation. This rough uh, normally goes from 30 centimeter up to one meter thickness. This thickness, of course, can vary, can vary, especially under the columns due to the solicitation. The reinforcement, the reinforcement use normally go from 40 to 80 kg per cubic meter of steel fiber, and when it needed, local mesh and river reinforcement possible just to cover the, the peaks that we have in the project. So some picture of this uh, realized project. In one of them, you can see the thickening in the bottom left side, the thickening of, 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 the, of the slab under the column. And in the other project, uh, you have the three meter gone water pressure. So this slide is just only to show you just a realized project in Belgium. So the important point here is that about uh, 1,000 cubic meter of concrete were poured in about seven hours only which will never be possible using just a traditional reinforcement. The, the next solution is the buffer slab foundation in for dwellings in, in the UK. This system is a steel fiber reinforced concrete slab on polyestyrene puts for better insulation. The system can be used for ground supported as well as for pile supported slab. This system is approved, of course, by the British Board of Agreement, uh, increase the production output and profits, and under the floor heating installation made very easy due to adjacent of rebars and messes. The slab reinforcement use is of 40 kg per cubic meter of HG plus one, one by 50 steel fiber. So in this slide, uh, some details of the UK method for housing and especially that there are no reverse interference neither during the pouring nor during the replacement of the heating tubes. Let's go to move just for tap slab, uh, free spanning slabs. So just uh, this, this project, in this picture we can show that a good concrete of till 100 cubic meter of steel fiber, tab is 1.3 by 50 high performance fibers. We can see the good consistency, the good stability, and the easy pumping and easy pouring and finishing without any vibration. Another reference of TAP slab project. This is uh, eight double houses in Estonia. It span up to 4.5 meters, slab thickness on of 20 centimeters. More details during the pouring. You can see the easy concrete placement. Two people are working, the others are watching. Eh? So we, have, we can save a lot of people. And the few rebars that you can see just in this picture are the anti-progressive collapse rebars. We will see it later on. In this slide is a cost comparison done by the general contractor of the job site, not, of course, by ArcelorMittal. 
So while the cost for the concrete mix is higher for the steel fiber reinforced concrete solution, due to the added fibers, the cost for the reinforcement and the placement of the in reinforcement is almost zero for a steel fiber reinforced solution. Due to redu the reduced number of people, curing is also cheaper. So at the end, uh, there is just a difference of around the 40% in favor of a steel fiber reinforced concrete. Another housing project in Tallinn. Uh, for this project, the slab, the slab was tested with pallets of bricks at service lot level. Mm. The span from 9 meters to 11 meters and the thickness of 20 centimeters, again with 100 kgs per cubic meter of steel fibers. Uh, this is a small training center in, in Luxembourg uh, where the ground rafts, the intermediate slab, and the walls were realized in a steel fiber reinforced concrete. The roof was done with precast hollow core slabs for the intermediate floor, which was spanning in another direction. The architect insists on a 1.5 meter cantilever. The bearing wall, the, the, uh, the bearing the wall as well as the roof uh, loads. So for this reason, the top of the intermediate floors was reinforced as well by rebars and to, to warranty the safe, um, the safe bearing of the hoogie wounds. So just the rough was thickening under the wall with a cantilever. Uh, especially pouring tests were done just to limit the number of fibers on the surface to a minimum for the walls, as this was architectonical concrete. So just uh, I would like to finish uh, the presentation with the most ambitious project ever realized worldwide in steel fiber reinforced concrete, mm, the 16-story tall Roca Almar Tower in Tallinn. Mm, so the only, only just the first floor was done uh, using the traditional reinforcements due to the numerous opening and variation in the, in the level that we have in this first floor. Uh, all, or, all other regular 15 floors were done using the tap slab, the concrete solution of ArcelorMittal. You can see again a thickness of 24 centimeters, again a dosage rate of 100 kgs per cubic meter of high-performance fiber tap is 1.3 by 50. Some details during the concreting, eh, especially the few anti progressive collapses rebars, which were the only traditional element used in the, in the floor. So, eh, as a conclusion, eh, we can say that today it is possible just to use only a steel fiber reinforced concrete in a structural application for housing and multi storied buildings. The concept is safe and shows a very ductile behavior. Quality control is a major key just to succeed. It is true that this new construction method is, method is actually mostly not covered by the standard, and a lot of conviction is required just to succeed. The first step has been done, for example, in the Spanish EHG, but never, nevertheless, the, we have a lot of reference objects exist today just in the European countries, as Austria, Belgium, Germany, Luxembourg, in Spain, of course, UK, Latvia, and Estonia. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, just for the coffee break. Mm? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. We go now to the second paper of this session. The title of the paper is The Reinforced Foundation in the New Sailors Below the Historical Buildings. The paper will be presented by Jesus Gomez, please. Good morning. <coughs> uh, in, this, in this paper, we have two buildings, but in this presentation, I speak uh, only about one building because we have 10 minutes. Uh, 
and I prefer to to speak about one uh, building and if you want uh, to ask something about the other building we can speak about it uh, in breakfast or oh yes I'm sorry uh, uh, if we can speak uh, about the other building we can speak about it in the coffee break for example or in the in the lunch uh, this second building this is the um, the, the Buen Retiro Palace in Madrid. This is a building from uh, 18th century. And uh, uh, this is the plan of the building. Uh, we have three, uh, we, we have some spaces than we, wh where we were. And this is the, the central uh, piece, and this in that uh, I speak about it. And this is the, the west, uh, facade, uh, and I speak too about it. The principal target in, in this project is to uh, build uh, two cellars, two levels more underground level. We have uh, the first, the first level, the second, the, the, um, the floor level, the, the second, and the, the roof, and we, we have to build uh, two uh, levels uh, below the ground level. This is the last uh, situation with the two new levels uh, below underground level. Uh, and we speak about this uh, area and this other area in the right, that is the west uh, facade. Uh, you, uh, we utilize, we uh, work with this uh, method to to build these uh, two new levels. Uh, we use the uh, micropiles uh, system, but uh, we use different ways to uh, support the uh, brick wall over the uh, micropile. The first way is that uh, we introduce the micropile in the earth, and we build the wall beam that we uh, join with to the brick uh, brick wall and when uh, in the after we excavate the earth and uh, we uh, build uh, the new structure concrete structure and uh, at the end we cut the micro piles uh, the second way when uh, I, I i will explain you because we use this uh, way uh, the second uh, way is this, uh, we uh, use this uh, steam uh, beam, this is the secondary beam system. We support uh, them uh, over this uh, principal beam and we support this principal beam, speed steel beam over the micropile too. When we finish uh, this, uh, this construction, we excavate the earth we uh, build again the new structure, the new concrete structure, and we cut the, the steel elements and the micro piles. And the third way that we use is, the, is this. Uh, we use, uh, again, the uh, secondary uh, steel beam that we support on the uh, concrete beam that we support on the uh, uh, micro piles. Uh, we build a uh, after we um, build the new uh, column of concrete, but uh, we built uh, we built them uh, around the micro piles. Uh, we don't need to cut them uh, after. This is the the this is the the plan of building. And in this uh, central area, we have the uh, Lucas Jordan uh, room. This is the reason because we use the uh, first uh, the first solution in this case. We have uh, at, in the at the top of the room this uh, pincher of uh, Lucas Jordan. Uh, we cannot uh, move this uh, vault any further. This is the perspective of the room. 
and we need to, to build these two levels uh, below the ground level. Um, this is the, uh, the, the method that w we, uh, we follow. The first, we, we build the, the wall, the concrete wall. The second, we build the uh, micro piles. The third, we build the micro pile shoes and the wall, and the, uh, wall beam uh, join to the brick wall. The, the third uh, phase, uh, we build the, the slab. Uh, after we excavate a floor, um, we, fix, uh, we uh, build again the new uh, slab, and at the end, we uh, excavate the second floor, and uh, the column, we build the, the, the structure, the concrete structure with column and beam, and we cut the, the micro piles. We need to uh, to join this and uh, to use this wall, uh, this wall beam to uh, to 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 reach that the um, brick wall don't move anything. This is some draw of this uh, wall uh, beam and the brick wall and the join. This is another draw. And this is some picture of the uh, wall, uh, wall beam. This is the, uh, the draw of the pile, of the micro pile, I'm sorry. That we must to add some uh, other elements uh, when we have a, a, a long micro pile. This is uh, the picture of the micro piles when uh, we, and after we build the micro pile shoes and to connect with the, uh, wo uh, with the brick wall. This is the, the slab that join uh, both uh, wall brick, Do uh, brick wall, I'm sorry. And this is a, a picture of the micro piles when we excavate all uh, level uh, below the ground level. Uh, in this side, on the uh, left, we have uh, the, the west uh, facade, and we have two different situations. We need to, to build uh, two uh, new uh, levels, and we have this four column over a wall, a big wall, and, uh, and this other column uh, over a wall, but uh, in the future we can uh, we can have this wall. Uh, <coughs> the first work that uh, we have to, to do is uh, to, to work is, the, is this, uh, this is the section, this two column. This is the half of this situation of the left. Two column, and um, we have to, to make the, the to, to to, to, to make another uh, level here, and to build this, and to, to have this new level, we build uh, with this method. We mm, build the micro piles, uh, both sides of the wall, uh, and uh, here is the, the principal uh, uh, steel beam, and the secondary steel beams that support in the principal steel beam. We excavate uh, this, uh, this area uh, uh, below the, the wall, and we follow the same way that I explained you. We have at the end the same uh, wall, but we have another level uh, below, it, below it. But in this case, we have a, a different problem, a different problem because uh, we have, uh, at, at the beginning, we have here a wall, but at the end, we, we cannot have here a wall. And uh, we, we use uh, the, the same method, the, the other method. <laughs> uh, we have here 
are here on the right and on, 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 the, on the left and on the right two columns. Uh, and we have here the ground level and below it uh, the, the wall. We built uh, uh, the micro piles on the right and on the left. We built the, uh, the steel structure. We support this column over there and we excavate this, uh, uh, this area. When we finish to excavate it, uh, we, uh, we build the new uh, uh, column, the new concrete column, and when we join this new concrete column and this old uh, column, uh, we uh, cut uh, this uh, steel structure and this micro pile. We have a picture, and this is the, the face uh, when uh, we, we have this uh, steel structure and uh, we build this, uh, we have excavated this area. We have the, the new columns under the old columns. And when we join uh, them, we can cut the, the steel structure and the micro piles. Well, Mr. thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, in rehabilitation, its case is a case, it's very good. We go now to the third paper of this session. The title of the paper is about the sublimation of structures, a philosophical approach, and the paper will be presented by David Montero. Please. Thank you very much to the organizers of this Congress, and, uh, and here I am after all these uh, serious uh, uh, conferences. Uh, I'm going to talk about something a bit more philosophic, as the title says. Uh, well, as introduction, uh, I've been uh, thinking about a writing of uh, the great ph philosoph philosopher of the 20th century, uh, Martin Heidegger. He wrote a, a small essay uh, titled Building, Dwelling, Thinking uh, about the architecture at his time uh, with the fascism and all that movements were, which were killing the, the man. Uh, we get to think uh, that uh, this story has shown us that there is two ways of building, a Roman way, a Roman way of building and a Greek way of building. The Roman uh, is about what uh, Edmund Burke and uh, Immanuel Kant would call um, the sublimation. Uh, make us feel small, make us feel uh, like nothing from in front of the structure, in front of the building. And uh, Greece's uh, way of building is the way of rational uh, way of building. It is all is organized in the space. There is. Uh, two theories, two philosophical uh, theories that talks about, about man, the duality and the dualism. The dualism tell us that we are a, a composition of body and soul, and that uh, they are in a fight. This is a lie. And there is another uh, theory, the duality. The duality tells us that we are a composition of, of body and soul, and we are a, a unique thing, a man, and this is the truth. In these structures, it happened the very same thing. Of course, uh, that uh, we, we got to try uh, to, to build something that is beautiful, not just uh, uh, make the, the structure to, uh, to, to get a shape, but uh, to, to tell something, to get a function, it got to be beautiful. We are not trying just to, uh, to make an sculpture. There is engineers, there is architects with us, uh, collaborated with, with uh, the sculptures, but this is not a, a, our mission. Our mission is to make buildings, to make a place where we can live. As we can see in, with the So Fujimoto uh, photograph that he's making a sculpture but he's made in a house. And it's really beautiful. We will try to, to make a historical revision to see how uh, the buildings has been uh, growing up, how we, we have designed the things, and we will see how uh, this structure has been the determinant 
a component which has uh, shown us has how, how to build. Uh, we'll start with the grids. Uh, as we can see in the Parthenon and all their buildings, uh, the structure is uh, completely organized. Uh, they are talking about the cosmos, how it is organized, we are there and we know where we are. And the shapes, the, the elements they use uh, to, to build, they are not capricious. As we can see, the columns and, and the bases of, of the columns uh, got uh, their sense uh, in, in the way the tensions and the pressures uh, move uh, through the material. Uh, well, computers are not my friends. Uh, well, and then we go to the Roman, uh, Roman way of, of building. Then uh, we get to, as I've told you, uh, to the um, sublimation of the structure. Uh, sorry. Uh, they want a uh, man to feel small in front of the power of the empire. The emperor is who, who, who orders everything, and its uh, citizen is nothing there. And the, the buildings want to sh show that. Uh, they, they find out uh, the arches, and that allows them that, to build that uh, a great uh, spaces uh, using the light and using that elements which will be so important in architecture. Then we get, uh, we'll jump over the, the G's and we'll get to the Middle Age, when a, a man called Calimagne Cal wanted uh, to, to get again uh, that splendor of the Roman Empire. Uh, he couldn't, he got and got the money, he got and got the technology to do that. What could he do? Uh, he uh, just uh, tried uh, to use uh, their imagination uh, to, to go back to that splendor. As we can see, uh, the valves uh, got the loads and that makes a problem of compression and tensions. And if they are long enough, uh, that uh, valve uh, would fall down. What did he do? He, he put it some arches. Uh, separated a certain distance uh, that allowed him uh, to support uh, the tensions and to build uh, that, that kind of buildings he wanted. And uh, that will uh, get uh, to its maximum spawn uh, uh, with the Cathedral of Santiago of Compostela, uh, where, which is one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. And uh, the Romanesque uh, get uh, to, to this higher point. We can see that all the tensions, all, all the, the forces are exactly controlled, but they are not obsessionated with the structure. They want to make us feel the space. They want to tell us something, and that's what they did. This, the mixture of beauty and technology, that's, the, that's uh, what we are trying to defend in, in, in this uh, comfort. Um, then it will get over uh, with the sister, uh, where people go back uh, to, to look to the nature. They, want, uh, they don't want uh, anything which is not necessary in the structure, and, and they come back to, to look to the nature, uh, doing these kind of things, these beautiful things where light is the, the only thing uh, that is uh, decorating the space. This is important, and we will come back uh, to this a bit later. Then in the Gothic, uh, there is the sublimation, sublimation of the structure. Uh, the structure is uh, the most important thing is what's telling us uh, in the use the pointed art, the words involved, and the buttress, but it's just because there is a philosophy under it. Always the architecture is behind the philosophy. The 13th century is the century of St. Thomas of Aquin and St. Francis of Assis, and they are telling us about the light, about how men can get to God. We, we can go over what we are. We can go over of, of the war, of, of the material, and that's what, what the structure is telling us. The structure is important to, to understand it because it's the very same thing that we are doing now in the 21st century uh, with, with uh, the high tech and all that uh, movements. And it's, it's a, a composition of sub structures which send the, the effort to another structure and they resist in a very economical way. And I think this is very important that with a, a very poor uh, technology, they were able uh, to solve uh, really difficult technical problems. As we can see, and I won't stop here, uh, and we get to the Renaissance and the Baroque. In the Renaissance, we, they go back uh, to the Roman way of, of building. Uh, they are not interested about the structure. The structure is just something that will let me uh, build my, my, my building, but it's not the important thing. 
I will use it to, to, to find the tensions, uh, to the visual tension as, as Michelangelo, uh, Michelangelo showed us, but, but it's not the important thing. They are, have come back to the Platonism, and, and uh, we can see it uh, in their buildings. And then in the Baroque, everybody thinks it's just uh, the beauty, just the decoration. It's not like that. We can see with uh, Francesco Borromini uh, that uh, the building, the structure is telling us many, many things. We got to think that he has worked uh, at the end of the Cathedral of Milan. Uh, it's a Gothic cathedral, and he has understood why, uh, how the structure works, and he will use it in each of his designs, as we can see in these photos. Uh, then uh, his, his enemy, uh, Bernini, uh, will, will forget about all that things, and he was just too surprised uh, with the light, with the shapes. It's just uh, that, again, the, the Roman architecture. And we will, we will jump again and we'll get to the, 20th, uh, the 19th century uh, when uh, the new materials, the iron, uh, the glass, uh, will take place and a structure will have, again, something to say. Engineers uh, lead this movement, but there is so, also an artistic movement, the, the Nouvelle Vague and all that things, the Art Deco, uh, which, which tell us that it's not just a structure, that beauty has something to say here. And I would like to stop a little with Antonio Gaudi, which is one of the most important architects who understood the mixture between the tradition and the innovation. And we will see a little uh, his uh, Sagrada Familia. Uh, he, he thought that God uh, couldn't just uh, put me in the war and don't let me build uh, the higher buildings I can. And, and he was wondering, how can I do it? And then he discovered the, the catenaria uh, that if you turn uh, over uh, an arc, it will resist any, any strength you put on it. And that's what he did. And, and I wanted to stop a little because with very simple operation with vectors, he was able to design and build in a structure uh, that resists. He didn't need a definite element uh, programs or something like that, which are useful, but are not the most important thing. We are uh, losing the control and losing the touch with how a building works, how a structure works. This is the very first thing. And then this computer programs can help us to go over and to know uh, uh, how can, can we um, uh, do it more economical. But this is not our objective. Our objective is to do beautiful things. And we'll get to the vanguards of the 20th century. Uh, this photo of the ladies of Avignon of uh, Pablo Picasso uh, has uh, broken our concept of art. They came the new people who said, here I am, I am the artist, if you don't like that, you are an idiot. And, and that's what they did, they broke the concept of time, they broke uh, the concept of art. And the, this uh, movement, what is promoting is the atheism. Uh, Miguel de Unamuno, a great uh, Spanish philosopher, used to say, if you look to the, comfort, uh, to the crucifixion of of Pablo Picasso, uh, you couldn't believe, but if you look at the uh, uh, Christ of Velázquez, uh, you could uh, believe you would be falling on your knees in front of the picture. And it will come people like Le Corbusier with, uh, with, uh, sorry, uh, with uh, his international architecture uh, that uh, broke up with the tradition uh, it would be called by uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, uh, uh, the irreverent, uh, the person who say, why, why we got to do the things as it has been done? Here I am, I'm the artist, and I'm going to do whatever I want. But he looks at the tradition, he looks at the primitive uh, way of doing uh, with the, his objects of poetic uh, reaction. So it's a bit, uh, it's not reasonable because he says no, but he says yes. And he, he doesn't control the shape, and his point of view of building a um, machine of living uh, ends with, with the, our conception of men. We are just machines. We are not, uh, we got not the dignity or something like that. But not, the hope is not lost, uh, because Mies van der Rohe showed us that with the new technologies, with that industrial way of working, uh, we, can did, uh, we can find the beauty. We take out all the things which are not necessary, just the structure, the structure talk to us and make something beautiful, something simple. He's an artist, he doesn't say so. And I would like to stop a little in the contemporary architecture, uh, 
looking at three examples. The first one will be Frank Gehry, the second one Norman Foster, Norman Foster, and the third one uh, Renzo Piano. The first one is Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry is one of those guys who say, hey, I'm the artist. If you don't like that, you don't know what the art is about. He, his, his models are just a big amount of rubbish, literally, uh, put in, in a way that he thinks he's beautiful, and because of the theory of the Gestalt, uh, invented in Germany in the 20th century, it says us that we just can uh, recognize objects, we've got a definitely a um, shape, as his, his buildings haven't, hasn't got a, a a shape that we can recognize, he covers it with, with uh, the very same material. And if it's expensive, it's better because people will talk about you. The second one is Sir Norman Foster. Sir Norman Foster comes back to that uh, tradition of, of the structure telling to us. Uh, it's really simple. He used uh, that thing that we have seen since the, the very first uh, course of our careers. And he used that element in a way that he may, allows him to, to, to design a real good uh, architecture. We can see with all these uh, pictures and how the structure uh, patterns uh, the space and drives us uh, through, through the building, which is very important. We got to think that uh, men are also space and time. Space is patterned by their uh, right. And uh, sorry, time is patterned by the uh, right, and space is patterned by the structure. And the third one is Renzo Piano. He, he does uh, the, yes, I finished right now. Uh, you are wishing, I know. Uh, he looks at the tradition of every country and uses the tradition to find uh, new ways of expression. And it's really interesting. He uses uh, the structure as a way of expressing. With the traditional ways, he finds a new way of, of expression of, uh, on, of architecture. And he always looks at every detail. I think that's uh, what architecture is about. And I haven't got far to conclusion, just say that poet uh, Chateaubriand uh, said in his, in his book, uh, The Genius of Christianism, that architects build uh, the ideas of the poets. And that's what I think this is about. That's all. Thank you very much for your uh interesting reflection about the evolution of the structures of the buildings, your geometry, your aesthetic aspects. We go now to the next presentation. The title is Air Conditioning Systems and the Geography, an Introduction Comparison. Uh, the authors of these papers are Miguel Cavic and uh, Antonio Gonçalves Coelho. Please. Hello, good morning, I'm Miguel Cavic, and I'm uh, talk about this uh, concept of air conditioning and relations uh, with geography. Uh, because at the moment, uh, I think there is a lack between geography and uh, the systems that are put in, in, in a building. If we see uh, houses, uh, traditional houses in, in Europe, usually they are different. So if we see a house in, in, in Portugal, for instance, it seems like this. Um, there are uh, yards. In Spain also there are yards and, and cloisters. Um, uh, houses are very connected, to, so persons know the neighbor. But if we go to other countries, usually houses are alone. So persons don't know so much the, their neighbors, and uh, they work more like a shelter than uh, a way to, to, to live inside and outside. So I think that's the main difference, I suppose. Uh, so uh, I think that in the southern countries, uh, persons live inside and outside. Uh, but if we go to, to offices, uh, there is not too much difference. So we could see a, 
a building, an office building in Portugal or in Germany, and we could change this to, to one to one side and the other one to the other, and we could say that it could possibly be the, uh, in the, the, the Portuguese uh, building in Germany or the Germany building in Portugal. And so the question is, why does it happen? And I will just focus in a very narrow, narrow aspect, which is the air tightness of the building. So the, the question uh, I put is, uh, might they be equally all over the countries? The second thing is, uh, do the air conditioning might impose the, the uh, uh, tightness uh, facade? And moreover, if it is necessary, that, that uh, air tightness uh, facade. Because at the moment, uh, most of the buildings uh, doesn't allow windows to open. And the question is, do we really need a building that doesn't allow uh, the windows to open or not? And to discuss this, I'll discuss two systems. One system, which is the uh, fan coil system, which is used in southern countries, and another one, which is which is started in the Scandinavian countries. The main difference, well, there are a lot of big difference, but probably the main difference is, sorry, is that the, the first one uh, removes the loads in the terminal units. So these little, I don't know if I can reach there, no. those little units, hmm, no, uh, those little units inside the rooms. So th these are, these are the, the, the equipment that, that are responsible for taking the, taking the loads. And the air handling unit uh, is uh, provi just provides the outside air and removes the, the sensible and latent heat from, uh, from the outside air. So there is one equipment for treating the outside air, another equipment for treating the uh, internal loads. If we change for the other system, it's different because the, the air handling unit uh, uh, introduces the outside air but uh, overcools it and overcooling it, uh, just remaining heat is going to be removed by the uh, uh, terminal units. And these terminal units just remove sensible heat, which means that they can't condense. So they, they, that it is impossible to have condensation inside the building. Uh, therefore, windows uh, are not allowed to open. And so the question is, is that a, any special reason for using this uh, system in southern countries? Uh, it is very used in, in northern countries because they can use the, the free cooling of the outside air. Uh, but do we really need it, this? And so I decided to, to take uh, cooperation between a fan coil system with uh, two solutions with variable uh, outdoor air flow and constant outdoor airflow, and an induction, an induction uh, units, cooling only and cooling and heating. Well, and try to compare these in terms of energy, uh, thermal comfort, and uh, indoor air quality comfort. And the results were like this. So uh, in, in terms of thermal comfort, um, the fan coil system is probably a little bit better than the than the induction uh, unit systems, mainly because they, does, they don't overcool the, 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 the outdoor air. And so some, some places using induction unit systems uh, will have, uh, will be overcooled in some instance. And so uh, they will don't get so, so much, um, so much um, uh, thermal comfort. But as they use more fresh air, they will have a better indoor air quality. So usually this system has better indoor air quality, as we see uh, in the in percentage related to total persons. Uh, so th they will have a better indoor air quality, um, but the, the CO2 concentration, uh, the maximum CO2 concentration won't vary too much. Moreover, in terms of energy, uh, if we see the, the top panel, we see a, a, a common fan coil system, 
compared with a, with a common induction unit system. And the induction unit system is a little bit better, about 5% five, five better. But if we need to, to, to have a better comfort, we go down, and we'll have the induction unit system with more or less the same, same uh, amount of energy. And if we decide it and go for the, for the lower in the left, the fan coil, and if, if, we, if we put in the fan coil a system that uh, varies the, the, the fan, it is possible to go even uh, to a lower uh, energy consumption. So it is, hard to, it is hard to say which is the best system. So one is probably better in, uh, in comfort, it, and of course depends on the, the way it will be controlled. Uh, the induction unit system probably will be better in air, indoor air quality. But also with the fan coil system we can introduce more air and do something similar. And uh, in terms of energy consumption, they are similar and in, uh, uh, depending on, on the solution. So uh, the question is wh why, why using a system that, that to apply? Uh, uh, air ties facade if the the if the the systems behave more or less in the same way and so the message I leave is a, a open window and uh, try to make systems that are uh, in accordance with the, the local culture and uh, with the with our relation with the, the exterior and uh, try to live in, uh, in a place that we can communicate with the outside. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for uh, this presentation with a reflection about the best system to control the energy, the indoor comfort and indoor air quality. We go now to the next paper. Uh, the title is uh, determination of the fire resistance of a masonry element affected by higher temperatures reached in a fire. The paper will be presented by Maria Eugenia Terragrossa. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freitas. I'm going to speak to you about the determination of fire resistance of a masonry element affected by high temperatures reached in a fire. The determination of high fire temperature or fire resistance of a masonry element is a complex question that only can be broached across numerical and experimental analysis. The masonry strength strength analysis at high temperature is a particular thermomechanical problem. The main objective of this study is to provide information and criteria with theoretical experimental base to carry out the evaluation of a masonry element that has been affected by high temperatures reached in a fire. The process of heat transmission across a material which carries the variation of the thermal properties depending on the temperature is directly related to the bearing capacity of the masonry element when it is subject to service loads and when it is the, the element comes to breaking load. In both cases, always in presence of high temperatures, the mechanical behavior of an element is a relation between its response or strain and stress of an unapplied load. This study shows an experimental investigation carried on a masonry element subject to thermomechanical actions to obtain the stress strength relation at high temperatures. For the work evolution, the developed specific methodology includes as much as experimental test programs as the mechanism as a test pressure. An experimental heat transfer device has been developed, combines both thermal and mechanical action, allowing to submit to specimens to stationary and a uniform evolution of their field of temperatures. In this way, the influence in a stress strength diagrams of high temperatures in a masonry element subject to compression under load has been analyzed. The masonry elements are carried out with clay bricks and Portland mortar. Here it is described the characteristics of those materials. 
for the bricks, uh, one phase perforated clay bricks, Spanish normal dimensions, without non absorbent treatment and fire at temperatures near 900 degrees, they are used. For the mortars, the made mortar was a M7.5 pre proportion for conventional use. The mortar was mixed in a base by a conventional mixer. The water was progressively added to the mass in order to reach a suitable workability. The water retention of the mortar was considered to be correct in its execution. A mortar did not show quick losses of water content in its disposal and was very workable. The masonry test samples have been built following the masonry hero recommendations relative to the preparation, confection, and hardening. The test samples have been made on a smooth horizontal surface, and the measures have been taken in order to avoid the drying, the drying of the specimens during the first day after construction. After that, they have been left in a laboratory environment. It is used a thin end joint of plaster wall with higher strength than the mortar of the test samples. In order to ensure the specimen faces on which the load will be applied were flat and parallel between them. The specimen has been warmed up by the refractory clay heater plates at uh, different steps of temperature. With a temperature controller, the stabilization of the temperature at the specimen has been guaranteed. Finally, the element is subject to the ultimate load and breakage. A new device for the experiments and 48 tests has been carried out in order to analyze the thermomechanic behavior of the masonry elements to different steps of temperature and to validate the test protocol. To ensure that the results obtained in this test could be applied successfully, the following targets must be reached. To establish a protocol that allows assuring the relativity of the results, to ensure a whole heat transfer to specimen in the test, the design to the device for the experiments, and to validate the results for the experimental device. Provided that does not uh, exist a specific test to obtain information on the compressive stress of masonry elements submit to high temperatures, a device is designed for such an effect. According to the masonry fire hero codes, to make a masonry element compression test, it is necessary a universal press that allows to apply such a load on a test sample with a uniform displacement on the loaded surfaces. If the plates of the test machine were minor, what that was the case, that the test machinery element distribution beams with the masonry length that the test specimen and the major equal thickness to the length between the edge of the plates must be used. To be able to reach an approximation to the compression test at the ambient temperature and be able to uniform distribute the load about the sum Benham principle, and provided that the test machine has cylindrical plates for its distribution, a flexion bridge was used was used before uh, in the above mentioned machine was removed and two dif distribution plates in a sandwich format of thickness, uh, seven millimeter, 17 millimeters uh, of thickness, were constructed. One of them will be anchored on the base of the bridge of a virtual flexion, is fixed, and the other one would be suspended for the top torque. And in this way, the free distance between them, the two distribution plates, was approximately enough distance to, be played, to place the machinery element. Two insulated and high strength plates, material plates, were inserted to the machine in order that heat transfer process was the best and were not transferred the temperature to the machine. The material plate is a very good uh, insulation material that can be bear very considerable compressions strength over 200 newton millimeters square that is foreseen by the maximum stress to be applied. The masonry elements are going to be placed at the top of the part of the universal press that has a capacity of 600 uh, kilonewtons. After placing the test sample in this position, two refractory clay plates previously covered by insulation refractory fiber sheets were placed to both longitudinal sides of this temp this temple. The same plates will close the perimeter of the test sample and a thermopart is introduced at the end to monitorize the temperature. To calculate the time, the time that masonry element takes in warming up to center temperatures, we apply the Fourier equation. Hereby, the necessary times in order that specimen test sample reaches, globally the step of which temperature are the following ones, as you see in the slide. It is very important to guarantee the thermal step to which the material is going to be submitted to obtain reliable results. 
The masonry wallet is subject to a temperature step when the masonry element and the device were placed. Six brick masonry wallets for every step are contemplated. Temperature from 50 degrees up to 700 degrees have been tested. The test to know the compression strength in masonry elements submit to te high temperatures were carried out at the laboratory of structures of the Technical Upper School of the San Pablo Theo University during, uh, during the July 2009. The way of breakage in masonry walls before and after, as you see in the slide, the way of breakage due to the, due the compression is the appearance of multiple fissures of tracing with clear vertical trend parallel bars to the direction of the application of the load. Provided that the tests are on a small scale and the slenderness and the eccentricity are not considered, there, no, there is not place to appearance of the horizontal cracks. Those are the, some of the results relative to the resistance capacity of masonry elements affected by high temperatures. In the table, you can identify the name of the sample, the test date, the temperature step applied of each case, and the compression resistance obtained of each one. In order to establish the treatment and the analysis of the results obtained during the test, the partial analysis are exposed uh, about the fire resistance of the masonry elements submit to different steps of temperature. And here's at the slide, here's an example of that. In the stress trend diagrams obtained for the period of the temperature between 20 degrees and 300 degrees, it's possible to estimate the masonry elastobrittle behavior. The diagram is indicate the behavior is in similar to the one that it's obtained on having test in a ceramic piece. In the period that of temperature from 300 to 700 degrees, the strength, strength, stress strain diagrams begins to behave in an irregular way due to the dehydration of the mortar and the lack of the adherence piece mortar to high temperatures. In the stress strength, sorry, in the stress strength diagrams obtained for all the definite steps of temperature, estimates the masonry elastic of brittle behavior, but as the temperature increases, the material behaves of heterogeneous form, imposing an irregular diagram, as you see in the slide on the right, uh, in the different moments due to the progressive disintegration of the mortar when piece mortar interface is affected by high temperatures and by the lack of adherence when the temperatures are increased. The masonry compression strength of mid to temperatures up to 300 degrees is similar to the one that the one that is obtained at ambient temperature. This means that the resistant loss of the mortar in this term and uh, interval does not influence in a decisive way the resistant loss of an element. In this first period from 20, 100, 20 degrees to 300 degrees, the piece compression strength takes part in a decisive way about the masonry fire resistance because the decrease in its resistant capacity is invaluable. It is material that supports high temperatures in a factor. In the term, thermal period from 300 to 700, a loss of fire resistance of a masonry element is about 17% respect of the compression, as you see in the slide, uh, resistant at the ambient temperature. It is dead essentially to the loss of mechanical resistance of the mortise caused by the process of the hydration to which it is submitted. Uh, finally, some of the conclusion about this study, the experimental study presented in, the work, in this work, clearly demonstrated that the compression strength of masonry elements during the first steps of temperature, up to 300 degrees, is similar that they obtain at temperature, ambient temperature, because the difference between them is lower than 300, uh, uh, excuse me, 3 percent. The loss of the compression strength in brick masonry at the high temperature from 300 to 700 degrees is 17 percent, respect of the initial resistance, principally because the hydration of the mortar. And the way of the breakage at temperatures up uh, to 300 degrees is similar to the produced at ambient temperature, fissures in the applied low direction, and when the element is submitted to higher temperatures, it begins to crumble due to the high deterioration of the mortar. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your clear and interesting presentation with interesting experimental results. We go now to the next paper. 
The title of the paper is New Developments in Cladings, Polymeric Curtain Holes. Um, the paper will be presented by Ostadillo, I think. Well, uh, my name is Julian Astudillo. I'm from uh, uh, Tecnalia, a research center of the Basque Country, and now uh, I'm going to talk uh, about a project uh, we are developing now, uh, and the subject of this project is uh, new developments in cladings uh, and polymeric uh, curtain walls. Uh, the index uh, of the project, uh, first I am going to uh, give a brief uh, uh, introduction about curtain walls. Next I am going to talk about the investigation uh, on composite we are developing. And uh, the third one is uh, the steps uh, that we are following to develop uh, this uh, curtain wall. Also this, this project was, uh, was supported by the European Commission under the seven framework uh, program we are now uh, working on this project and we are going to finish uh, next, next year. The main purpose uh, of the project is the definition, development and verification of the new nanocomposite materials for this use like structural profiles in curtain wall system in substitution uh, to metallic profiles like uh, steel or, or aluminium. Uh, Curtain walls are uh, currently one of the most used uh, type of facades. They are composed by two principal, uh, uh, two mainly elements. The first one is the structure. Now it's uh, from aluminium and um, from uh, steel. We try to uh, to uh, uh, put uh, put it uh, as a composite. And these uh, these uh, curtain walls are, uh, have also. Uh, filler materials that now are from uh, glass or opaque uh, materials. There are uh, a lot of uh, uh, systems of this uh, uh, type of facade. The two uh, most important or uh, more common, uh, most common are the stick system. Uh, you can see here uh, the, the, el the elements that have a stick system. Uh, he has a structure uh, and the glass and the joints and the, the rest of the components that form uh, the, the entire uh, facade. The, uh, the difference between the systems are uh, principally, uh, are mainly uh, about uh, the construction steps. Uh, the, the stick system is a, a system that we uh, uh, const construct uh, in on site. Uh, all the elements uh, are taken to the, to the work and then uh, are uh, uh, building on, on site like a, like a mechanism. Uh, its uh, main advantages are uh, that it, this is a system that is easy to build, is economy, and is very adaptable uh, to, the, to any kind of, of building. Uh, some disadvantages is that uh, all the work must be done uh, on site, and we have, for this we have problems uh, uh, regards the quality of the finishes, and this is the typical system uh, that uh, where most of the problems are uh, solved, adding uh, a sealant, which uh, sometimes is bad uh, uh, because it's a, a temporal uh, solution. Uh, this is a system that we use for uh, uh, mainly uh, little and small buildings. The other system uh, is the unitized system or modular system. The, the components of, the, of this uh, curtain wall system are similar to the stick system, and the difference uh, uh, we found uh, we found a big difference uh, on how we construct uh, this uh, this system. This is a, sim a system that we uh, uh, we uh, manufactured on on a factory 
and then we uh, uh, transport uh, these uh, modules to the to the work and then we only have to to put an anchor uh, anchor them uh, this is the system that is uh, most uh, uh, used uh, now uh, if we talk about uh, big buildings uh, big big buildings like uh, skyscrapers or uh, uh, very unusual uh, unusual uh, buildings it's, uh, the advantage is that you have uh, more uh, quality because you uh, uh, manufacture all the system on on a factory and the big problem is that you need uh, an entire factory uh, because you have to construct uh, or to manufacture all the elements in the in the factory uh, to perform this project, uh, we we want to uh, to substitute uh, the one of the elements of these uh, curtain walls, the structure, because uh, the materials used now present some some problems. Uh, we have uh, environmental problems because uh, these uh, metals need pretreatments and coatings. Also, we have uh, condensation problems uh, because. Uh, uh, the metals have a, a high thermal conductivity. Also, we have uh, thermal problems because the metals are very good uh, conductors. And also, uh, to uh, construct uh, this or to manufacture these uh, curtain walls, we need to add uh, to the profiles a, a thermal bridge uh, break. Also, this, uh, this addition of the TBB uh, implies that the construction of the, this system uh, is uh, more uh, complex because of the necessity to include uh, this TBB. And, and we have also uh, corrosion problems uh, because uh, uh, we have compa com compatibility uh, uh, problems between uh, different metals, so we can have galvanic uh, corrosion, and also the metals uh, uh, can be affected by pollution or climate condition and uh, have electrochemical uh, corrosion. A possible solution to uh, these problems is to replace uh, this metal profiling with a polymeric uh, nanocomposite. Uh, with this substitution, uh, we have uh, some advantages. Uh, between environmental, uh, there are that we don't require any, pre these materials don't, don't require uh, any pretreatments or coatings, different between the uh, metals. Also, we have less problems uh, in condensation because uh, there are, these m materials have a, a high uh, level of insulation. Also, we have uh, thermal advantages because uh, the composites are natural insulators, and also we don't have to include the TBV in the profiles. And also, because we don't have to include this TBV, the profiles are less, uh, less cost to manufacture and is easier to uh, construct and assembly. Also, we don't have uh, corrosion problems because uh, the composites are inert. Uh, we don't have galvanic corrosion and are not affected by uh, climate uh, or uh, pollution. To select uh, this composite, uh, firstly, uh, we began to, uh, to select thermoplastic uh, polymers uh, reinforced with short glass uh, fibers and uh, thermoset polymers uh, reinforced with continuous glass uh, fibers. After uh, some tests that we performed to these materials, uh, we noticed that uh, the thermoset polymers uh, uh, have uh, better mechanical performance and this is the material that we are going to use in, in the project. Also, uh, we added uh, to this material a, a modified uh, nano clay and a fire retardant to improve the fire behavior of this uh, material. With this addition, we uh, uh, achieve that this uh, composite auto extinguish uh, after switching the, off uh, the flame source, which is a very important thing about uh, fire. Also, this, uh, these uh, profiles are manufactured uh, by, uh, by pultrusion, and in this slide you can see uh, uh, different profiles that uh, are used now uh, uh, using these, these materials. For the curtain wall uh, development, 
Also, the, the, the curtain wall is a, a, a construction system that have uh, the similar requirements that other other uh, uh, elements of the of the building. We have uh, structural requirements in curtain wall. They are uh, very high because of, of the uh, condition of the of the of the system. Also, we have thermal uh, thermal profiles. Which is one of the things that we can uh, improve in the in the project, and also have uh, the, the the same uh, requirements that other other system like acoustic, hydrothermal, or fire uh, protection uh, requirements. Uh, to uh, to um, develop uh, the project, we choose uh, one of the uh, this curtain walls uh, base system according to uh, the necessity of uh, prefabric prefabrication. We think, we think that the future is to build the things uh, on factory, not uh, on site. Also, the speed, the modular system, uh, uh, you can uh, build a facade, a facade very fast because you only have to put in, in the building and to economy because uh, the, the faster uh, times and, uh, and the, better, the better results. Uh, we decide to use uh, the unitized uh, uh, or modular system also because uh, uh, it involves the uh, following benefits. We have uh, fewer tasks uh, to perform. Also, we have uh, a better quality in the execution. We have time saving on site uh, assembly. Uh, we don't need uh, uh, additional elements uh, like uh, scaffoldings, and we don't have on-site improvisation uh, and so on, uh, a better quality of the curtain wall. And to finish, uh, the steps that we uh, follow to development uh, the investigation are the next one. Firstly, we uh, make the election of, the, uh, of a composite, uh, taking in mind uh, different uh, aspects. With this uh, composite, with this material, uh, we verify the, 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 their behavior uh, uh, performing uh, simulations and some, some uh, real tests. Also, we uh, use the, character, the mechanical characteristic of the, this composite to perform simulation of a whole system, a whole curtain wall system. And uh, with the data that we obtain, uh, we uh, apply uh, this data to, the, uh, uh, to modify the geometry of the material and to achieve all the advantages of the, uh, this, this type of uh, material. And now, uh, because this is a project that we are uh, performing now, uh, we are uh, uh, build, uh, building the, these profiles. And uh, we think that uh, for the uh, first uh, month of the next year, we uh, can uh, uh, do a, a real test uh, on a curtain wall prototype and to compare uh, this uh, test with similar curtain wall system that exists uh, on that that exists now, and uh, see if the uh, the results and the the needed uh, requirements that, you, that we have in the project are uh, achieved uh, by this, uh, this system. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution about the technology of curtain walls. So we need to continue this session. We go now to the next paper. Uh, the title of the paper is Influence of the Construction and Demolition Waste Treatment Process on the Characteristics of Mixed Recycle Aggregates for Non-Structural Concrete. And uh, the paper will be presented by Lisbona. Please. Uh, good morning. My name is Amaya Lisbona, and I'm from Tegnalia. The work I'm going to present is about the influence of the treatment process of the construction and demolition waste in the treatment plants 
on the characteristics of the recycled aggregates which are obtained. The construction and demolition waste which was used for the study was a mixed trouble. I'm going to use CDW from now on for construction and demolition waste. And the recycled aggregate which is obtained had the aim of being used for non-structural concrete. Okay, to study that relationship between the uh, production process and the properties of the aggregate, nine treatment plants were selected in Spain, as you can see on the map, and their treatment process and the characteristics of their aggregates were studied. For purposes on, of the present study only, the plants were divided into three categories according to the impurity content of the CDW, which was accepted for recovery. And category one is for the plants that, ha and that accept very mixed CDW for treatment. Category two is for the plants that um, treat mixed CD, uh, CDW, w, sorry. And finally, category three is for the plants that treat only selected CDW. As you can see, the, the nine um, study plants are in the table. Three of them are in category one, treating very mixed CDW. Five of them are in category two, treating mixed CDW. And finally, there's one plant in category three. And as I said before, we studied the treatment process at the plant. And there is a broad a variety of solutions at the different plants, but the technological basis is the same. And in the table, the treatment process that is applied at the nine plants has been summarized. And the number of times that each of the different processes is applied on the studied aggregate has been shown, and including magnetic separators, blowers and cyclones, which are pneumatic separators, manual sorting points, water separation equipment, which is separation by flotation, and then in crushers and screening points. Okay, we'll move from the treatment process to the characteristics of the recycled aggregate. And in the table, the, the, character, the studied characteristics are shown, and these properties are of interest as the aggregate is going to be used for non-structural concrete. Out of all these properties, and from now on, I'm going to talk about the next four, which are the impurity content, the gypsum content, the lightweight particles content, and the flickiness index. Okay, the impurity content of the recycled aggregate is the total content of asphalt, clay, earth, glass, wood, and gypsum in, in the recycled aggregate. And the, we've seen that all the samples from the plant from category three, which treats selected CDW, presented low impurity levels in all the samples. But the samples from categories, from the plants of categories one and two, which treat very mixed and mixed in CDW, present a broad range of impurity contents, in some cases, even in samples from the same plant. That's why uh, we say that the restrictions on the impurity content of the CDW, which is accepted for recovery, um, leads to more controlled impurity content of the recycled aggregate. In spite of that, as you can see in the graph, um, the more separation systems installed at the plant, including magnetic, hydraulic, and pneumatic separators and manual sortings, the more separation systems, the, the lower the impurity content in the aggregate. Uh, the, the gypsum separation at the plant is mainly based in manual sorting nowadays. Nevertheless, I would like to mention a new separation system that has been, well, in, which uses nearby infrared sensors to detect gypsum and some other non-desired materials like plastic, and non ferrous metals. And those particles that can be detected by the infrared sensor are separated using a blower afterwards. 
uh, one of the study plans has um, installed one of those systems, but it was installed after, after the study was finished and the results are, are not shown here. And in the table, the study plans have been ordered according the, to the average chief sum content of their aggregate. Well, as with the impurity content of the aggregate, the gypsum content of the aggregate and presents more controlled values if there are restrictions on the impurity content of the waste that is accepted at the plant. Surprisingly, however, plant one, which treats very mixed um, rubble, presents a very low gypsum content. That can be related, or in general, a low gypsum content can be related to having more sorting points. Also can be related to the limited size of the, of the material that is sorted. If you, pay, if you take a look at the plants with the worst results, you can see that they all treat a big uh, sizes or a broad range of sizes. And finally, in some cases, applying the manual sorting prior to the crushing appears to lead to better results. And let's move to the next property, which is the lightweight particles content. As you can see in the graph, the more um, pneumatic separation systems is told, the more blowers and cyclones, the lower the lightweight particle content. In, in this table, the plant, um, the information about the fraction that has been treated at the pneumatic separation has been included for the plants that apply either one pneumatic separation or two pneumatic separation. And paying attention to the plants that present the better results at the two groups, which are plant four for the plants with one separator and plant seven for the plants with two pneumatic separators. And it may seem that in, if in, if the fraction which is treated at the pneumatic separation is small, the lightweight particle content is lower. But there is one plant, which is plant six, which uh, has two pneumatic separators treating small sized fractions, and, and its result is not as good as suspected. That can be related to the fact that in plant six, the same material and is treated by a pneumatic separator twice, which is not what happens at the other plants that have two pneumatic separators, because at those plants, and the material is separated in two, and each of the groups, each of the fractions, undergoes its own treatment. So that's why a second pneumatic separation applied to a previously treated fraction seems to be less effective. And this is the last property I'm going to talk about, which is the flickiness or shape index. And as you can see in the graph, the more crushing points and the more screening points at the process, the lower the flickiness index. That tendency can be um, slightly modified if the accepted CDW has a high ceramic material content of bricks. So let's take a, a look at the conclusions of this work. And the, the study reveals that the technology employed at the plants has a bearing on the final characteristics of the recycled aggregates obtained. And if there are more separation systems, more crushing points, more screening points, and also if the treated fraction is smaller, and in general will have a better results, which mean that we have a um, lower impurity content, a lower gypsum content, less lightweight particles, and, and a lower flickiness index. Nevertheless, the, CD, uh, well, sorry, nevertheless, the technology that is applied at the plant, the, the impurity content of the CDW that's, that is accepted at the plant for, for treatment determines in great measure the impurity content and the gypsum content of the recycled aggregate that we are going to obtain. 
So I just would like to suggest that we think about um, our construction works and the characteristics of the waste that we generate at them. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting contribution. We come now to the last paper of this session. Uh, the title of the paper is uh, What Water Quality Management? This contribution comes from Slovakia, uh, Technical University. Uh, please. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Daniela Očpla and I'm from Civil Engineering Faculty, Technical University of Košice in Slovakia. Uh, the topic of my presentation is the presence of bacteria Legionella in a hot water distribution systems. Uh, my presentation is divided into three parts. Firstly, I would like to say a few words about this bacterium, then uh, some parts from my research, and finally, I will sum up. So let's start with the first point. Um, there are a lot of guidelines and regulations um, um, developed in many individual countries for the design, operation, and maintenance of tap water system to avoid the growth of this bacterium. Uh, missing regulations in Slovakia, but the presence of this bacteria in the water systems is to be expected. Um, Legionella pneumophila, waterborne bacteria, it is a motile, rod-shaped, gram-negative bacterium, and it is considered to be the facultative parasite which has been identified as the leading cause of the Legionnaire's disease. And this disease was discovered in 1976 among the group of elderly men attending an American legend convention uh, in Philadelphia. When this outbreak firstly occurred, it uh, really shocked the nation and also the world because nobody knew why all of these men were being diagnosed with acute respiratory failure. Uh, looking at the chain of events, the presence of this bacteria in water systems, especially in hot water distribution systems, is to be expected. Um, here are some conditions that encourage this bacteria to grow. Uh, you can see that it's a slow-moving stagnant water, then it's a biofilm and sediments, also, very important is temperature range from 20 to 50 degrees of Celsius. A widely accepted theory of the disease transmission of Legionellas is that this organism is aerosolized from water in a water system, and then it's inhaled as a tiny or micro water droplets and get into the lungs. So, um, so much about the risky factors. And now I, I would like to talk a little bit about my research. Um, from February through October 2006, a total of 50 water samples uh, were collected from the boiler houses in Košice, which is the representative of uh, Eastern Slovakia. Um, after the identification of each uh, building, we asked the random family or the working collective to participate in our study by completing the questionnaire. The laboratory examination and Legionella analysis were made by the Regional Health Office Referential Center for the Potable Water in Košice. Uh, the presence of this bacteria we found in 70 persons of the samples. Um, we found the 20, from the 20 um, colonies per 100 milliliters up to a massive colonization 6,700 in potable water cold and also in potable water hot from the 200 up to 14,600 colonies. There was really necessity to react promptly due to positive findings in residential areas. Um, for that time, the most reliable and available solution was the thermal disinfection. However, there are still places not reached by the disinfection which remain the contamination source, so we repeated our sampling uh, immediately after the, uh, the thermal disinfection, and uh, the results were almost negative. But uh, long-term monitoring shows that these bacteria could regenerate really very quickly, uh, normally in a 12 days. So we also repeated the sampling after the 12 days, and the level of Legionella colonies was almost the same as before the thermal disinfection. 
In this case, the measures have proved that the thermal disinfection is not a suitable system treatment for our case. So, after the meeting with the main heat supplier in Košice, we decided to use a new approach by using the water safety plans and also um, the risk analysis. Here you can see the proposed risk management method for the experimental exchange station P1. It consists of these steps you can see on a slide. Uh, we decided to use the semi-quantitative matrix for the assessment. Um, uh, according to the results of the risk analysis, the extreme risk has been assigned to the water heater tank, um, which in my case was um, considered to be the local source, not the systematic, but the local source. And then we decided to minimize the microbi microbiological risk um, by using the simulation methods by software Fluent 6.3, the version. Here you can see the geometry of the boiler. This boiler is, of course, in this exchange station P1. Um, here comes the question, in which layer is the temperature insufficient and, in a, and where the stagnation can occur? So we simulated two um, situations. The A situation was the standard operation and the B situation was the thermal disinfection. Uh, here you can see uh, the boundary conditions. As you can see on the first picture, the bottom of the water heater tank uh, is in uh, the range of really risky temperatures from the 35 to 45 degrees of Celsius. Um, also, we used the uh, <clears throat> pictures or images from the infrared camera uh, to see if we are, if the simulations are good. Um, also, the stagnation. The stagnation has occurred in the blind junctions of, the, uh, of our um, experimental boiler due to almost zero speed or no water velocity. As you can see on another, in a, on a, in a B situation, uh, the risky places did not change, but the layering has changed, of course, because temperature is really higher. Um, also, the stagnation of water in B situation occurs in the same places as in situation A. So, to, you can see the blind junctions. And due to the stagnation of very low water flow and also low overheating of thermal disinfection, the point of highest risk is clearly the bottom of the tank and it is the, the sludge blow off in our case. So um, it should be the common goal of the stakeholders or investigators to take care about the system to ensure the system to be not the risky. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your good contribution. Um, according with the program, this is lunch time, but I think if you agree, you, we can have a few minutes for uh, one, two, three questions maximum. Short remark, uh, when the first question appeared, this session is uh, very interesting with eight different papers to discuss the steel fibers in reinforced concrete to discuss the problem of sailors in historical buildings, to discuss the evolution of structures of, and geometry of the buildings along the time, um, to discuss the best, mechanical, the best system to control the energy, the comfort, uh, and the indoor air quality, the ex one ex very nice experimental study of thermomechanical behavior of, of masonry connected with fire, technology of curtain walls, recycled materials, and uh, the Legionella in the water system. This is a general summary of this session. Um, I think it's uh, very good, th this paper, this contribution. If uh, we don't have question, I think it's in reality the last time, we can stop here this session. Thank you very much to the authors. Thank you very much to the audience and congratulations for the organization of this session and this conference. Thank you very much.